Good morning, everyone. So nice to see so many people here. This is amazing. Um, if it gets noisy, we can always close the door, um, but I think we'll be okay. We, I, it'd be nice if we had a little bit of air. Sorry I'm a little late. I was getting our children's faith formation off and running. So while this is happening here, they're all over in Cowell, so this is great. Before I do my formal uh, welcome for Mary Jo, I just want to say thank you so much for being here. This is just such a treat. It's so exciting that we have such distinguished parishioners. <laughs> I'm kind of fangirling. <laughs> so yeah, this is, this is really a treat for all of us. So uh, my name is Lisa Fries. I'm the director of adult and children's faith formation here at St. Ignatius. Um, welcome to our inaugural La Storta lecture. This lecture will be, be recorded and will be made available via our YouTube channel for anyone who would like to re-watch or you can forward the link to others, and we'll have it posted on our website. Before I introduce our speaker, I see Father Greg in the back. Do you want to come up, or do you want to not speak? You're OK. I just remember <laughs> he's like, he's like, ask me if I'm here. OK, I'll talk, and then you can decide what you want to do. Um, a brief word of explanation. No, we do not have a new donor named Lestorta who has endowed this lecture series much to Father Greg's chagrin. Um, by all means, if you know of anyone named Lestorta who is interested, just talk to me after we finish. In St. Ignatius's autobiography, two short lines are offered to describe what some would say was the culmination of Ignatius's spiritual journey. One day, a few miles before reaching Rome, he was at prayer in a church and experienced such a change in his soul and saw so clearly that God the Father had placed him with Christ the Son that he would not dare to doubt it. God the Father had placed him with his Son. So this was the end of 16 years of Ignatius praying to Mary to be placed with Jesus. And to be placed with Jesus was Ignatius's ultimate desire, not just to be a companion of Jesus, but to carry his cross. So that is what happened at Lestorta. After 16 years of courtship, he found a level of intimacy with Christ, desire to be placed with him for better or for worse, not out of duty, guilt, or expectations, nor out of a desire to suffer purely for suffering's sake, but simply out of a desire to be with Christ. And somehow, in the world in which we live, an intimate connection with Christ always leads to suffering, does it not? The good kind. And so, the Lestorta Lecture Series, which is, quite simply, talks, a little informal engagement, from those who are walking the walk in order to inspire us to follow Christ more fully in all that we do, for better or for worse. Now to our speaker. Mary Jo McConaughey is an award-winning reporter who has covered insurgencies in Central America and economics in the Middle East, in addition to what the book that you're reading today. A St. Ignatius parishioner, Mary Jo's book, Playing God, American Catholic Bishops and the Far Right, delves into the issues of partisan politics, dark money, and power. On behalf of Father Greg and all the staff, I'm delighted to welcome you, Mary Jo, as our inaugural La Storta speaker. Um, since we don't have the lavalier set up, I can happily use this, yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Lisa, for all your work for the parish and for organizing this. Thank you very much, Father Greg, for, um, for everything. I am going to start by reading from the introduction because I think it may answer some of the questions that you have and leave it open for more questions that you may think of. It'll be about five minutes, and then I'm, since this is billed as a lecture, I'll go to the lecture part, which, is, which will be about another five minutes. So <laughs> this will be about you, your thoughts, and um, uh, dialogue, I hope. The euphoria with which American Catholic bishops greeted the Supreme Court decision to overturn Roe v. Wade, 
reflects how much the prelates claim the victory as their own. This was a victory 50 years in the making. The most conservative among the bishops will continue their efforts in alliance with far-right Catholic laypeople, like-minded evangelical Christians, and ultra-right polit politicians to implant a nationalist Christian dispensation in the law and culture of the United States, believing that their own moral point of view ought to reign for everybody throughout the land. Today's cohort of US bishops reflect, excuse me, <laughs> this is really important, do not reflect the global Catholic Church as a group. They are a particularly <clears throat> American species, hierarchical to a fault and, to, and so traditionalist and politically right wing that they are out of step with the current occupant of the chair of St. Peter. Some of the US bishops do support the vision and priorities of Pope Francis, and many are faithful in letter and spirit to Vatican II. But so intransigent is the conservative majority, and so strong is the financial support for their positions from the wealthy, as well as from allies in political and legal spheres that American Catholic prelates can be expected to help spearhead the country's rightward lurch toward nationalism and rule that reflects Christian values as only they see them. This remains true whether Pope Francis leaves the papal throne by resignation or in death. U.S. bishops want to insert their vision of Catholicism into aspects of law and society that go beyond religion. They really don't want separation of church and state if their moral values are missing from politics and culture. Their views align with those of the six members of the conservative majority of the US Supreme Court, all of whom were raised Catholic. Now, I have no animus toward the Catholic Church or its bishops. As a lifelong Catholic, including years reporting from Latin America, I have seen the extent to which my co-religionists, including bishops, have gone, even to the point of martyrdom on behalf of other people and of justice. At the same time, I have always believed that the institution of the church was worth investigation and critique. Someone asked me very recently, why now? Why did I write this book now? Like other Americans, I was shaken by the events of January 6, 2021. I saw those hours through the eyes and ears of a reporter who has covered war religion and politics, both at home and in autocracies abroad. I've lived through coups. I, I know what they feel like at the beginning, and that was what I felt like was happening on January 6th. In the end, it didn't succeed at that time, but it was a coup. Uh, now in my nation's capital, I watched in horror and disbelief at one man's exhortation to loyalists to rise up and march with him to upturn the law. I saw crosses and Bibles side by side with Confederate flags, nooses, and other symbols of white supremacy connected with ultra-right Christianity and Christian nationalism. I tracked the reactions of people on social media and in the alt-right press, a very toxic exercise, <laughs> believe me. I, 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 I did it as a job. 
including multiple far-right Catholic outlets. I saw how they conflated the figure of a strong man, in this case, Donald Trump, who disdains democratic norms with Jesus Christ, how the extremist among my co-religionists exuded a sense of embattled Christianity expressed in comparisons of supposedly repressed Catholic believers with Jews killed by Hitler. As a reporter, indeed as a Catholic, I felt it was time to look at the U.S. Church as a key institution playing an outsized role in the current dangerous political moment. Uh, thus, this book, I, you know, sometimes a publisher will consult with an author about what they'd like to see on the cover or what they absolutely would not like to see. And I forbade them completely <laughs> to put a cross or a, a cross on the cover. I said, this is not about faith, it's about politics. And they happily, of course, complied. They had to. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, just in, in this brief time we have together, and I know some people have read the book and others haven't, but I want to suggest that this current cohort of U.S. Catholic bishops, not every single one, but the majority, is a threat to democracy. Their stand in the public square is important to us as Catholics who look to our clergy and bishops as pastors. But it is also important, I believe, to us as individual Catholics expected to live out the church's mandate for faithful citizenship. The catechism tells us that taking part in civic life is a moral obligation. The political stand of our bishops, I suggest, is something of which we must be aware to fulfill this obligation. Their stands and influence support Christian nationalism. That is a political ideology, uh, excuse me, that is a political ideology that maintains God intended for ours to be a Christian nation, guided by the principles of the founding fathers as Christian nationalists see them. I know, never mind that those fathers were slave owners, almost universally white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, and recognized the political agency only of the men of the species. There are a lot of contradictions in looking to our founding fathers as models. Uh, Christian nationalists are in a fight against what they see as secularism. In this fight, the bishops align with the political beliefs of white evangelical fundamentalist Protestants. The fight is funded by dark money. That is money whose sources pass through a web of so-called nonprofits can be hidden by law. And uh, just as an aside, it was one of the Catholic uh, legal uh, agencies that um, helped to, or that brought that case before the Supreme Court that made this possible that it could be uh, legitimate by law. Uh, Christian nationalism is a danger to democracy. I just want to give a couple of examples here of what I'm talking about on the part of rightist bishops, and we can then move into our discussion. Take uh, something with which we're just very recently familiar, the COVID emergency. Bishops were among these right-wing bishops of whom I speak, the majority, uh, were among anti-vaxxers. They were slow to support government health mandates when they did not oppose them outright. One bishop after another encouraged attendant at attendance at mass with or without masks, even while civilian authorities were limiting gatherings. The bishops 
who did this suggested that resistance to government directives was a freedom of religion issue. Our own archbishop went so far as to suggest that the mayor's rules on gathering in San Francisco were particularly directed against Catholics. Invoking a sense of persecution is a Christian nationalist trope. Uh, and this was done even though the rules applied to all, and they arguably kept San Francisco among the cities with the lowest incidence of the disease at first, and we hope continuing. In the case of the most right-wing bishops, resistance to the COVID mandate served two purposes, undermining government authority, which is another Christian nationalist trope, and digging in their heels against Pope Francis, who's, who said famously, remember that, that beautiful walk he did through that rainy St. Peter's Square right at the beginning when Italy was really suffering from this, and here he was alone making his way with some difficulty uh, to say we're all in this together. And he urged the faithful many times to follow government health authorities. So this was one way to say to the Pope, no, I don't think so. The bishops threaten democracy when they target basic human rights. In the case of women, autonomy over one's own body. In the case of gay people, the right to join in a committed, blessed relationship, a marriage, if you will. They threaten democracy in another way. You know, we Catholics believe that sin can be not only an act of commission, but but acts of omission. Despite their powerful voices and their conference, the bishops' conference that possesses one of the most powerful and effective lobbying groups in Washington, the bishops threaten, by democ threaten democracy by what they have failed to do with regard to what has been called the country's original sin, racism against people of color. They are almost totally absent in this fight against increasing attempts at voter suppression, which is, of course, aimed at people of color. Famously, one of their important documents on race was titled, Brothers and Sisters to Us. Now, if that doesn't show how little uh, the bishops have internalized the pain and feelings of separation of, of African-American Catholics, I don't know what does. But they were also absent in wholehearted support for Black Lives Matter, one of the biggest social justice movements of our time. Archbishop Gomez of Los Angeles, who was then president of the Bishops Conference, even called social justice protest at the time an attempt to establish an alternative secular religion that was undermining Christianity in the country. Parenthetically, just let me mention that at least two of Black Lives Matter's Catholic founders were influenced by liberation theology, and Pope Francis compared activists who protested racism at the time to the Good Samaritan who went to the aid of the man who had been beaten and was lying at the side of the road after religious authorities ignored him. So just lastly, I also suggest that the bishops become a threat to democracy to the extent that, to the extent that they have become identified with the Republican Party. This is despite what the party has become. The Republican Party is different from the days when my Democratic re uh, politician grandfather worked hand in hand with uh, 
Republicans in, D in Indiana to get anything done. The Republican Party has come to stand for something else than what it used to stand for. It stands now for an exclusion. And its undisputed leader is an anti-democratic figure that few inside the party dare challenge. Which brings us back to the threat to democracy acted out at the Capitol on that January 6th and my spur to writing this book and having this discussion. So perhaps, Lisa, Lisa did you want to um, take over the uh, discussion? Bear with us, we have a couple of logistical things to do. Let me move the chairs, we're gonna start to see what's going on. Okay, so what we're gonna do is, Mary Jo and I are gonna talk for just a little bit. It's kind of the same model if you went to our Vatican II series. There'll be a little bit of a conversation and then we will open up for questions. I'm gonna have a microphone that I'm going to ask you to kind of pass around so that your questions and the answers can both be recorded for the video, okay? So after this piece, we'll have two mics and you'll see how it goes. Stay tuned. If there's anybody who has a question that doesn't want to be on the video, we can talk later, okay? Can I be heard? Not yet. Can I be heard? Yes. Super. Thank you. Okay. Closest. Okay. Really, thank you all for being here and for your interest in this subject. Where's, where's my book called? Is it behind there? Is that one mine? No, that's mine. I just feel better with it in my hand. Okay. We didn't practice this part, hang on. <laughs> it's all right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Gotta rehearse this. How's that? Okay. So. Yeah, and you. How about, uh, oh, you've got the mic. Okay, great. Warms up. All right, great. Thank you so much. Um, it's hard to be casual holding a mic, so just pretend I'm being casual, okay? So this was great. She, uh, Mary Jo came and, and spoke with a book club that I was able to sit at, so I, I have a little bit more information on what she did earlier in her career. And I have to say, um, I was really interested to hear that you spent time in Saudi Arabia and that you sort of called that your journalism school. And I'm wondering, uh, not to dive right into it, but to dive right into it. What kind of parallels do you see between, if any, between, say, Wahhabism and the American far right? <laughs> so I'm just kind of curious. So anyway, I'll let you define Wahhabism, and then we can kind of go from there. Yeah, I probably won't talk about Wahhabism <laughs> <laughs> so much as talk about any kind of very, very fundamentalist um, which Wahhabism is, and uh, uh oh, 
it's not happening, huh? I'll trade you. How's that? I'll trade you. I'll take that. Uh, it was extraordinary. It, it felt um, uh, to be a Catholic in Saudi Arabia because you couldn't uh, express yourself very openly. On Sundays, we went over to Aramco, which is next door to the place where I was living, and went to the RC Club, Roman Catholic. Um, <laughs> and um, that's where uh, Father said Mass. That's where I was even... Uh, uh, blessedly a godmother to a, to a new baby. I mean, it was all um, what very interestingly what one of the women who felt a vocation to the priesthood told me in this book about her studies for ordination. She said, yeah, we all had to be catacombed. And that's kind of what we felt like in Saudi Arabia, <laughs> as if uh, maybe we were, you know, Catholics. I mean, of course, it wasn't anything like that, but, you know, romanticizing it a bit. And you had the religious police uh, going after you if you happened to be in a shop when um, prayer time was. Uh, and you had to have, as a woman, uh, a man you could point to that said, oh, that's my... It's an Arabic word for keeper, <laughs> because you couldn't be traveling by yourself except on an, on an airplane. Um, so what I really got from however, not, not all Muslims are, are Wahhabi and follow this kind of uh, extreme religion, and one thing that I really got from those years was a respect for the piety of faithful Muslims. I mean, stopping what you're doing five times a day, wherever you are, um, and anyone who's present, uh, a person who can read and write, a male or female, leads the rest in prayer. And this to me was, was very impressive. So I guess bottom line, is that um, I, I realized both, uh, both there and here that uh, fundamentalism, because you can have fundamentalist Catholics uh, and certainly fundamentalist evangelical Christians, leads to intolerance, and that's just not a good thing. Thank you. I was I was curious because um, having spent a little bit of time in the Middle East, I mean, there's as broad a spectrum of obviously of Muslims as there is of Catholics or any other religion. So, yes. um, yeah, and it's always been it's always been curious how you would function as a female in that society. Oh, that's another and story. We'll yeah, another that. story for another day. <laughs> yeah. But but you sort of see a little bit of resurgence. You know, Amy Coney Barrett, for example, and the organization that she kind of belonged to. So at any rate. Um, in, in terms of having cult-like aspects, the most extreme of the, uh, the Muslims uh, with whom I came in contact had a, a cult-like aspect uh, to them. Um, my Muslim friends with whom I had lots of discussions and lots of good times did not have that. I guess it's kind of like we can't paint everyone with the same broad brush, right? Absolutely. And especially now, you know, I'm only suggesting this only because you know we have people here, we have kids coming into faith formation, and Catholic is getting a little bit of a, I don't know, resurgence, and not in a good way in the medium. So in the media, so it's it's remembering for, I don't know, just kind of looking at it in terms of. Okay, we're we are on a spectrum here, and and you can't really categorize anyone in one camp or another, and I think that's an important part of this book is to delve down underneath what's kind of the surface, what they would easily the easy sound bites, right? So thank you for writing it. Um, I only have one more quick question, and then I would really like to open it up to you. 
if you've read this book, you know that uh, our Laudato C circle gets some play, which was really exciting. Um, so I'm just wondering if there's if there's something in particular that you that really drew you to talking about that, or or any any additional points you want to make about the importance of that movement and what well, the Mary Rose Le, um, LeBaron is has organized this circle and and went through the training and has a, a, I mean we have a lot to be grateful for to her. Is anybody here from the circle? I asked if somebody here. Good, sister. Teresa, would you like to say something about the circle, why you belong to it, and what it means to you? Hang on. I think Mary Rose has been a real leader in uh, pushing us on the matter of climate change and, bar and safeguarding the environment and all of that. And uh, she's really pushed us, I have to say, you know. Uh, you know, we, we stop doing plastic stuff, you know, and all of these little things that we do every day. So uh, she's been amazing, and it's not just that. They do clothes drives for people, you know, and all of that. October 15th. October 15th, <laughs> yes. So she's she's been wonderful on it. And so I think we're a pretty large group now. I think it's somewhere around 60 right now of people that are actively involved online, you know, in different parts of the country sometimes. So thank you for bringing her up. Oh, absolutely. Anybody else from the circle want to say anything? Uh-huh. Oh, Mary, I was just going to mention you if you didn't mention yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about your video. Boy, that's scary. <laughs> um, oh, the video. Oh, Well, during the pandemic, I, I'm a trasher, and I don't know how many of you have seen it or not, but um, I go around, I pick up garbage, and I've been doing this all my life. I've done it for different reasons, but um, I get into a state of meditation when I do this. And I get into a relationship with the earth, and when I see the bugs and the butterflies, um, and uh, I mourn a little bit. And I get excited a little bit, but mostly I, I, uh, I just join myself in some kind of union, uh, try seeing the world, hopefully trying to see it as God might look at it. And what a wonderful gift it is to us. And um, it's just, it's a form of prayer. Oh, it is a form of prayer. Yeah. And Mary... Mary is a wonderful e example yeah. of what yeah. the circle does. Now, well, that's just it. It, it, it is mm -hmm. a change of your spirituality. Your yeah. spirit you can't help. It puts Laudato yeah. Si into uh, the, the great encyclical of Pope Francis just shortly after he became Pope. His, I think he's been working on it his whole life. Um, and shortly after he became pope, he, he issued it. And of course, what to watch for is, is next week, next week, October 4th, I think, at any rate, it's pretty imminent, will be uh, part two. And that is going to be something to watch with regard to our bishops. Why? Because U.S. bishops have been, I would say, notorious in their failure to promote Laudato Si. Uh, probably a lot of different reasons. One reason perhaps is that, you know, Pope Francis was a scientist. I've visited a lot of, several people who knew him in Argentina. He was a scientist before he uh, studied to be a priest, or while he was studying to be a priest. And, and he knows, he knows in his mind, never mind in his heart, what the uh, what cli how climate change is uh, is a danger, and uh, now this part two is I think going to hold people's feet to the fire, uh, and he is considering uh, the conceptualization of environmental sin. Uh, now that's going to be a big one. Uh huh. Got some more questions. So. I think this will, yes, I would like to turn it over to the audience to move on. Um, whatever questions you may have, 
um, particularly related to the book. I'm grateful that we were able to bring it home and talk about what we're doing here as a parish. I think that there, are one of the things that I'm always focused on is how do we offer our children, our young people, ourselves hope in terms of moving forward. Um, so this is this is one way to do it, right? Transforming our spirituality. Okay. And then we can come back around to each other. Thank you uh, for coming and talking to us. Uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit, your book goes into some detail about the relationship of the Pope with the Catholic bishops. And uh, I wonder if you could talk about their tone with the Pope and especially the language, the of vitriolic language, almost almost hateful language that the uh, bishops show towards the Pope. The language of many very conservative bishops uh, about Pope Francis uh, or toward Pope Francis uh, from calling him Bergoglio rather than using his, his title uh, to, and I think this is maybe the worst, even though when you re read the language, and I had to read a lot of US uh, Catholic press to do this book, and I was appalled at the kind of language they could, uh, thought they could get away with in talking about Pope Francis. It's, um, it's serious, it attempts to chip, chip away at his authority, and it's uh, quite widespread. Uh, I, I didn't write this in the book, but, uh, and it, because it's rather, I don't know what you'd say. I, I, this book has 30 pages of uh, close based sources, and I couldn't get a source for this. This was out of my own head. But I also want to suggest that some of this comes from that same racism that that compels so much of US history and of which the, uh, ba the bishops have been absent on. You know, this is the first non-European pope that we've had. Uh, uh, I mean, in, in, in anybody's memory. And not only that, but you remember during, uh, well, since the Monroe Doctrine and certainly through the Central American Wars, this constant reference to Latin America is our backyard. And now we have a Latin Pope from our backyard. And if you tell me that racial attitudes don't have anything to do with this uh, attitude toward the Pope, I, 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 want you to, I want you to think twice about that. But also his stand against unfettered capitalism uh, does not, uh, automatically sit well with the bishops in the largest capitalist country in the world. And especially Laudato Si hits bishops where much of, not much, a significant portion of their money is coming from. Anybody that's read Laudato Si knows what I'm talking about. Uh -huh. Hi. Um, is there any hope for the Catholic bishops group? I mean, how many more bishops does the Pope have to appoint before the dynamics of this group changes? Um, the number of auxiliary bishops that the Pope has nominated is something like 78. Um, and of course, he has elevated bishops uh, within the conference, and he has nominated uh, many, but they do not form a majority of the U.S. Uh, Catholic Bishops Conference. Uh, the proof of that is the most recent election of uh, the new officers and the new, offi the new president of the conference uh, is uh, the bishop that ministers to the military, people know this, right? To the, to the military, and he uh, had put his foot down against, well, let's put it this way. He 
it suggested that the military did not have to get vaccinations, even though the Pentagon uh, said they did. And he objected to the Pentagon uh, allowing partners of um, uh, uh, people in gay relationships, uh, letting their partners have the same kind of benefits as um, married partners, uh, even though this was a Pentagon law. So uh, this is the future, the near future, of the U.S. Bishops' Conference. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Does that answer the question? Yeah. I mean, the, also the fact that bishop, the fact that Pope Francis nominates bishops does not necessarily mean that they're all going to, you know, kind of get in lockstep with what he says. Uh, po the Pope is, seems to be nominating bishops all over the world for their pastoral uh, capacity and their pastoral uh, grace. Uh, and they may object w uh, to the Pope um, uh, uh, with the Pope's vision and certain, uh, on, on certain points. But they are pastors, and that's, who, that's whom he's looking for. Well, maybe this is a comparable question, but um, how does one urge some of these uh, gentlemen to retire? I mean, how is that process going? How does that process go? Okay, I, it might be the echo, but I'm not understanding. How, I'm not hearing the question clearly. How, uh, what is the process for bishops to retire? Is it age-based? Is it, uh, how can they be urged to <laughs> their golden pasture? I, I don't know the details of that. Um, maybe, maybe Father can tell us uh, at what age a bishop is eligible to retire, probably 75. Is that correct? Yeah, and uh, those who can vote in the, um, uh, these groups that, or the group that elects the next pope, I believe it's 80, uh-huh, it's age 80. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't think we ought to count on any kind of um, people dying off <laughs> in, in, or, re, or voluntarily retiring when we're looking at this situation. I think if we're uh, following this, um, uh, you know, the, the, the proper uh, faithful citizenship path, we, we might be thinking about what we can do about it now. And to, uh -huh. Sir? Yeah. Uh, one here and one, one here, here and one here and one here. Uh, I'm not exactly sure <coughs> how I should frame my question, but it's uh, what is so shocking to me is the amounts of money that is characteristic of the organization of these conservative bishops. Um, and I am horrified when I think of the Supreme Court and our Catholic justices who live in the same block as these um, very, very, very wealthy people who organize um, events, um, this is, t this is totally shocking to me. Bob and I got a letter from the Cardinal Archbishop of New York. I've never met him in my life, okay? He invited me to, s uh, Bob and I, to some event in Laguna Honda. They would pay for our hotel Laguna room. Honda. Laguna Beach. Oh, Laguna <laughs> Beach, excuse me. <laughs> Not Laguna Honda. <laughs> wrong, wrong Laguna. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, and, and um, they volunteered to pay our room, and the chief speaker was Jerry Lewis. Jerry Lewis, the comedian. Is this Catholic? <laughs> you know, it, I, I, the, the, the amounts of money floating around the Napa Institute uh, is appalling to me, and the bishops that have retired and are living there in this posh hotel, I mean, it's shocking to me 
that this has grown so wildly, um, it's frightening in a way. Remember that the Catholic Church has always been the, the wealthiest of the, uh, of, of the national churches. And it has used its money in different ways. And the money now has come very often through these untraceable sources to the, to the point that you have even, I would suggest this, um, the Benedict XVI Institute, which is part of our own archdiocese, the person who, who runs it formally ran an organization called National Organization for Marriage, which was specifically targeting gay marriage. And that group was funded by um, one of these dark money entities, the Wellspring Foundation, which is run by uh, individuals who also belong to Opus Dei, which is a very uh, fundamentalist, I would suggest, Catholic sect. And where did that money come from? Uh, various funders, including Charles Koch, who I, makes all his money from fossil fuels. And so this is one reason that, that I suggest that we know what's going on in our own backyard. And what's in our own backyard could be the United States. It could certainly be our own archdiocese. Uh, it could be our own parish. I think it's important to know where the investments of the church entities are going. And you can ask. I mean, it's our money, right? I mean, we're the church. It's our money. <laughs> um, and uh, I think this is a perfectly legitimate tack to take, among many others. Lisa. Uh-huh. Excuse I, me. Uh-huh. I, I don't have a question, but I do have gratitude. Uh, and uh, uh, let's just hear him and then, okay, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no, go, go, go. I have gratitude. I believe the saying is doesn't pull any punches. And I appreciate you being so direct and factual. And it's important to spread the word about the facts. Thank you. Well, thank you. And I, I figure... <laughs> You know, what's the alternative? What's the alternative? To keep going the way we're going? I think that is, uh, in, in, I think that's a dead end and it's not a good idea. And that's why, yeah, that's why we're doing this. Uh -huh. Did you have a follow up, Joan? Sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> you had a question. Yeah. Hi. I wanted to thank you for being here because you're the perfect person to answer a question that I have. Uh -huh. And I'm glad you said this isn't religious, it's political, because uh -huh. this is a political question. As, I, as I've heard, and it may not be true, the bishops, the US Catholic bishops, have contracts with our Congress to fund the NGOs that are at the borders. And you mentioned that they're not globalists, the US Catholic bishops. And this would make them more globalist, in my mind, if they're accepting money to run these organizations, and they're getting millions and millions of dollars from the but Congress. Sorry, what? They're funding the NGOs, yeah, you're the suggesting, that are on the border? Uh, yeah, organizations that are on the border. And they have a contract with our US Congress to do that. And they get millions of dollars. And yeah, I don't know, well, is you know, that true? You can get me any more information about that. That's is very that true? interesting. I, what I, do you, know. I thought you'd be the perfect person to tell me yeah, if that was true. But what I, I mean, I'd be interested to know more about that. But what I do know is that various Catholic entities, those who give awards to, um, to our Archbishop, to uh, uh, DeSantis of Florida, uh, to uh, various attorneys general who have brought certain cases before the um, uh, Supreme Court, this is Catholic vote, uh, also have thrown money into uh, the kind of electronic tracking of uh, Catholics 
in order to be able to um, find them uh, to to uh, send out election material um, on, on GPS. This is a big story that National <coughs> National Catholic Reporter did. But with regard to the to the border, they have also um, uh, brought a lawsuit against um, some of uh, the most important people on the border uh, doing refugee work, including Sister. Thank you. <laughs> uh, who the Pope calls his favorite nun <laughs> for for the work that she does on behalf of the vulnerable at the border. So these far right Catholic institutions are no friend of immigrants, let alone of Catholics who are working to make their lives better. Thank you so much for your book and your talk and bringing this information. I'm, um, I feel like the Catholic bishops embody everything that I <laughs> think is wrong with the Catholic Church. And I appreciate that our first you know, item of business is to get ourselves educated, but can you give some action points for what a concerned Catholic can do next um, about yeah, what can a situation? concerned Catholic do? Um, pray, <laughs> I would say. Know where your money is going when you contribute, not only to Catholic entities, but to other entities which may be supporting some of these very, very far right uh, uh, pro projects of the far right bishops, of the far right bishops. Uh, I think. The Synod on Synodality is a huge uh, beacon of hope. And as much as we can participate in that and, f and, and, and follow through on that and, and, and hold our clerics iron their you know, feet to the fire um, about what is going on with that. You know, this cohort of U.S. bishops would just as soon eliminate the synod on synodality completely. Uh, a dear friend of mine since age six who uh, was for several years the um, provincial of an important religious order uh, in California wrote to me yesterday um, and uh, and he said, do you know that every priest in America, too bad Greg stepped out, uh, has received this book uh, from Tradition, Family, and Property, which is a very, very right-wing organization, which calls me a Jacobin. So I'm very <laughs> proud of that. Um, a Jacobin. <coughs> uh, and, <coughs> excuse me. And um, they have the foreword to the book by an American Catholic bishop, uh, I'm sorry, Cardinal Burke, mm -hmm. uh, which totally trashes the synodal process. The name of the book is Pandora's Box. So to the extent that we can support the synodal process, I think that is a step in the right direction. Maybe other people have other ideas for what a conscientious Catholic can do in the face of this, what I would suggest is an emergency. Lisa? Uh, this may be related or not. Um, can you address the payouts to sexual abuse survivors over my, did you get it? I, I'm, I'm hardly hearing you. Can you address the payouts, the financial payouts for sexual abuse survivors it seems to me it's very hidden and non-transparent. That's one question. And the second question is, can you comment on the role of women becoming clergy and how hot button that is? And is that universal? Is it American? Is it just those two issues? Yeah. Our own uh, archdiocese has filed for bankruptcy uh, largely due to the 
payouts for the sexual abuse um, crisis. And in, in a way, it's what has been a moral bankruptcy has led to financial bankruptcy. And my only comment is that it, it was inevitable. I mean, one diocese after another. And for all the pain that that's causing, I mean, we have to think about the pain of those who, who were victims of, of this abuse. And I just don't think there's any way out of these bankruptcies. Uh, ba bankruptcy is, doesn't mean that you're, you know, bankruptcy is reorganization. That's, that's what it is. So it's not as if the archdiocese is gonna fall apart. It may mean that, that people are not going to get uh, their, I don't know, it, you can't call it financial due because there's no uh, paying for the, those kind of experiences, but they may not get um, any payments uh, that, that legally they were meant to get. Um, what about women's ordination? I'm sorry, what about it? <laughs> uh, is it on the, yeah. Oh, the question was whether that is a strictly American, uh-huh. Of the 200 and, I don't know, it's probably 300 now, but at least the 280 uh, women priests who practice um, and who have gone through you know, seminary training and who have been ordained since 1970, I think it was 76 or 78, since the first seven. Most, most of them are Americans, but not all of them. What the Amazon Synod was approaching, and this is why it was really trashed by, uh, I mean, this is one reason it was really trashed by tradition, family, and property, and their ilk, uh, was giving a, uh, was recognizing the work of women in the parishes all over the Amazon uh, by uh, uh, allowing them to have an ordained uh, role, probably beginning with, with deacons. Um, and also to have men of uh, good character who were married uh, to be priests. Both of those are forbidden, of course, now. Uh, and the more open, no, let's put it this way, the more right wing, I hate to be so uh, ba painting with such a a broad brush, but and, and there is a lot of nuance in it. But I mean, you know, we, we only have so much time. Uh, the more right wing of the bishops are those who put down their foot against it the most. Uh, uh, Bishop McElroy, for instance, in San Diego, who said there oughtn't be anything forbidden to women, which is not, you know, which is not forbidden in, 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 uh, um, in the magisterium of the, of the church. Um, if, you, if you look back at the history, what, um, deacons, you know, I don't even want to start with women deacons and how absolutely necessary they are. If we're going to be, a, a, you know, a church in the world since 1962, isn't that when uh, um, Pope uh, John the Twenty Third said, we've got to let the fresh air in, but we also have to reach out through that open window out to the rest of the world. That's what the people in the Amazon were trying to do. You know, if you had a, the same number of priests in the Amazon as you, Italy would have, uh, I mean, proportionally, Italy would have 16 priests. And I, I, I've been a lot in the Amazon, and I see how women, especially the sisters, they totally run the church there. Why are we denying them? an ordained ministry. And I suggest in a lot of places, women are certainly right up there with uh, ordained male clergy in running the church. <laughs> and so, so what are we doing? What are we doing? And I mean, let's move on with it. Let's get on with it. 
and, and complete Vatican II, complete 1962, and reach out to the world. I get upset at that. <laughs> I try to be really, really the journalist as I write, and I am, but I think as I said the other day, when you write, something starts with emotion, and then you go into the actual writing in a professional way, and you try to put that all aside, but you just saw some of the emotion. <laughs> so I guess, Lisa, oh, we have one more? Yeah, hi. Uh, um, hi. I haven't read the book uh, fully yet, but I look forward to uh, reading it. I wanted to piggyback on the question about what do we do as Catholics with sort of the other question, which is what if you do if you're a Democrat? What if you do if you're a Republican and are trying to find a way to be the kind of Catholic and the person of faith that you would like to be publicly? I work in higher ed. I think it's, very, it's much easier in this town to admit you're a Democrat than to admit you're a Catholic because of all the tropes that come associated and then anything you say after that is gonna be viewed through that lens. Um, I run into a lot of college age students who do not have the ability, they don't have the language to be able to thread that needle, to be able to say that you know what I believe, what I'm gonna vote on is based on my faith and my political views. And I guess I, my real specific question is, in your, hit, in your due diligence for the book, did you come across legislators who are doing a good job of modeling how to work with faith-based organizations and can give, can young people can look to it, say that, that, that's, what it's lo that's what it looks like. That's what, when you can have thoughtful, constructive conversations about decisions that are both faith-based and both politically driven, because it seems yeah. like we're just defaulting yeah, to they're always in tension. Especially with young people, well with all people. I don't think that you can do what I did, which said that the saying that the bishops are erring to the extent that they identify with the Republican Party as it is today. Y that's not the approach. Uh, it, 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 you know that uh, there's a very famous uh, uh, Catholic priest, whoa, we're getting to the time. Um, okay, uh, uh, who uh, is supported by um, Bishop Strickland of Texas, and they say, you cannot be a Catholic and vote Democrat. Well, I don't think saying you can't be a Catholic and vote Republican is, is gonna do it. I think you really have to start with the individual Congress people and uh, make your relationships to them and, and do your voting. Y uh, uh, looking at the whole picture, I, I don't feel like I'm answering this uh, um, sufficiently because I feel like it should be yes or no. And, and, and it's just not. Save the fact that as we get toward next year, it's going to be very, very difficult if, uh, the ex-president is the candidate. It's going to be very difficult, I think, for any person of faith, I'll just say it, to vote Republican. Uh, it, it's almost another question, you know, because there's a lot beyond, before that that could happen. But it, it's going to be a big year. It's going to be a big year, especially if there's a third party candidate. Uh, the consequences are, uh, are going to be very, very serious if the, if the vote goes a certain way. Uh -huh. uh, do you feel that uh, these conservative US bishops have the same animus that they have towards Pope Francis towards Vatican II? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You can listen, as I have done, to dozens of talks from the Napa Institute, both from bishops and from lay people, and never hear 
the phrase Vatican II mentioned and never hear the name Pope Francis mentioned. Yes, I, I, they just don't get Vatican II and they fear the grace of Vatican II and the changes that it mandates. Yes. Mary Jo, thank you very much. Thank all of you for being here. We do have a couple of copies of Mary Jo's book if you have not had a chance yet. I think she's also willing to sign them, so. Um, our next AFF event will be Real Talk About Race. Our movie, The Mission, will take place on October 8th, right here in Xavier, and there is popcorn. So we will see you there. <laughs>